another extraordinary entrepreneur, Jesse Meekum, author and founder of You Need a Budget. Tell me about it. I think <laughs> timing and risk tolerance and budget are the simplest ways. We call it the YNAB, Y-N-A-B. Jesse, welcome to the playbook. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here, David. Well, you know, you talk about and your expertise is taking control of your money. That's right. And, you know, financial literacy, I work with Marshall Falk, run the, a team together to help. It started with just athletes. Now it's vets and now entrepreneurs of how literally to take control of your money, because that's what financial literacy is about, is actually having a system in place to take control of your your money and people around my office and community have been bragging about you your app and they're like dave this makes it so easy to gain control of your money you know what are some of the rules that you've developed to take control of our most important currency of this vibration this object Absolutely. of energy we put into the flow to get what we want yeah money is just another form of energy it's just a store of energy right you spent all this energy to to create something of value, someone paid you for it. And now you're just holding a dollar or whatever in your hand. And then the question is, how do I use this energy that's now just in the form of a dollar? And, and that's kind of where we shine. We, we've developed essentially four rules for people. The first, very first rule, and this will sound familiar to you as you think through time management and priorities, but our key is to tell everyone, we want to, to give every single dollar a job before we start using the money. So I want to have a plan when, when I have a little pile of money, $300, $3,000, it doesn't matter. I want to ask myself, what should this money do before I'm paid again? And it's interesting, David, to have people, they all come to us stressed and that's fine because stress is the norm for finances. It doesn't have to be, but it is for so many people. And they come to us stressed and we walk them through that little exercise. We tell them, just what's the money you have on hand right now? Don't tell me what you're going to earn. Don't tell me about the big commission you're going to land. Don't tell me about the house that'll close on Friday. We want to just deal with the stuff right now. What is it? And they'll say, oh, well, it's uh, 350 bucks, but I make my, and, and we'll say, like, stop. Don't tell us about tomorrow, today, just in hand. What do you have? You pull up on your phone, you look at your bank balance, small or large. What do you want that money to do before you're paid again? And it's interesting how many people walk us through that little, exercise 10 minutes later and say, Oh, my word, I feel so much better. And all they've done is just, they've decided to be proactive, instead of having things come at them and say, Hey, I want your money, I want your money, I want your money. They're saying this is what my money will do for me. And, and that's our first rule. And that's how we kick things off. That's amazing. The uh, other thing about your app and rules is they're all fun and good. And a lot of people preach and teach about money control and budgeting and money management and they oversell back end sell lie manipulate and cheat people <laughs> in the auspice of trying to help them with their money they take their money yeah. um but adherence to me is a key component what i mean by adherence is money to me is a part of my routine it's a part mm -hmm. of my daily routine it's a part of my adaptable routine that part of my daily inventory is to understand the timing and risk tolerance of everything, all the activities, especially around or concerning money. Um, how important is a budget routine? And do you guys have a suggestion on one that works? Yeah, well, if you're just getting started, the routine should be more frequent, not less, because you're trying to kind of build a new muscle and you wanna, you wanna adapt to it a little bit. So when you first dive in, we, I mean, I'd say, heck, pull up on your phone, instead of scrolling through the gram or whatever it is, and that's all fine and good, but maybe take, 30 seconds, pull up in the app and just look and say, okay, how much money do I have here for the, for restaurants? How much money do I have set aside for, for this or that? How much money set aside for the next bill that's coming in? And it's amazing how often people would just kind of build that muscle as they frequently look at it. As you get more adapt to the idea of checking beforehand, do I have this money before you spend it? Then people will realize they get into a little bit of a rhythm and you don't need to babysit it so often, but I would say uh, less... I, Weekly would be a nice little sweet spot for most people. I've tried all kinds, just experimenting on myself. It's just important that people recognize they need to be in the, in the money a little bit. They need to be acknowledging, here's what my, my money needs to do for me. And then when new money comes in, we need to say, okay, what should this money do now as well? And as we kind of just get to know what our real values are, and we line up with what our money really wants 
to do, which is to serve us, right? As your, as your values and your money line up, you'll find that you're very content, even though you maybe haven't doubled your income or you're not killing it on the income side of things. You're not even, you're, you're not even cutting back. You're just, you're in alignment with what you really care about. And when you're in the money daily like that, it ensures that alignment. And that's when you feel the peace. And that, that peace is essential because it's a re reaffirmation that we're all healthy, happy, wealthy, and worthy. It's what are we doing to interfere with the happiness that we have, the health, the wealth, and the worthiness. And all four of those are so closely tied. Yeah. In the pragmatic world, money effectuates your health, your wealth, obviously, your worthiness, and of course, even your happiness. Um, but it is also besides giving us this great light and great love and helping us learn lessons, it can be the number one killer or means to killing people because stress is the number one factor that money is the number one factor that people list for stress yeah. across the world. Not, not just in America, around the world, what stresses you out most money's number one. We're not playing family feud. Just trust me. You'll get the most points. If you say money, um, you have a great methodology of teaching people how never to stress about money again. What are some of the things we should look at to lessen the interference that we've created by this illusion that m money holds a, a certain part in our lives? Yeah, absolutely. You, you nailed it on the head. The money is a stressor, but I mean, when we're alive, we're going to experience some stress. So with life comes some stress, and we all know that to be true. What we try and eliminate is the unnecessary, unsystematic stress that money can bring. And it's the same way when you get into a market, if you broadly diversify and you're investing, there's some systematic risk because your money is out in the market. But if you're all in Apple stock, you're also carrying some unsystematic risk, some that you could diversify away. And we want to do the same thing with how we manage our money here. So I mentioned giving every dollar a job, and that's, that's rule one. Rule two is to look ahead and to say, what are some of my larger, less frequent expenses? And then you break those up into smaller amounts. So for instance, people will routinely be surprised by the holidays, even though every year they, they, they're there. Like December 25th, we all know it, it never changes. And yet everyone kind of acts like, oh my gosh, I just didn't realize this would come up. That's one expense that you could look and say, okay, how much do I want to spend on Christmas this year? And for easy math, I'll say, you want to spend $1,200. You take the $1,200, that's for the future Christmas, not the one that's coming in a week or whatever. And you divide it up so that you're spending a hundred dollars every single month, but you're not spending it this time. You're just saving it. So over the year, you're just piling up a hundred bucks every single month, hundred bucks. And it's like, you're paying yourself a Christmas bill instead of paying a credit card the next year, after all the damage has been done, you're just paying yourself. So not only are we taking our current priorities, and we're saying, here's what I want my money to do. But we're also taking our future priorities. It's like having David now that I'm talking to and future David, and they're both coming to the table and they're like, well, I want this and I want this. And you're having to negotiate with each other. And heaven forbid you're married or you share finances with someone. There are actually four people at the table. And that's what we want to have that discussion around. And it's not that there's anything bad or wrong or you shouldn't or you should. It's just, okay, what does future David want? Well, he wants... Uh, to retire. He wants to be healthy. He wants to maybe have a little space, have some acreage to farm. I'm making stuff up for you, but whatever it is, right? It's important that he comes to the table and says, Hey, current David, don't blow all of this, right? I'm not going to be, you talked about athletes. That's a, that's a sweet spot. You're not going to be 25 to 30 years old with a, a genetically gifted body that can do amazing things forever. You just won't. So future you has to come to the table and be like, hey, man, I know you can run fast now and I know you can leap over tall buildings, but in a little while, I'm going to need something. So let's plan together. That's the essence of rule two. We're just taking current priorities and future priorities and we're negotiating those two together. And priorities are so important. You know, I talk about uh, the real key to passion, purpose and profit is priority. It is the, the healer of procrastination. Uh, when you have a pro something prioritized, there's no procrastinating. There's no laziness involved. There's no interference. Priorities are key. Um, and you kind of look on the budget uh, to simplify, you know, yeah. how to prioritize because 
you actualize the values that you have within the context of a budget in order to figure out what am I going to do today, right? Yeah. What am I actually, and I love the fact that you don't talk about, there's a lot of future pressure when we're talking about money and YNAB, you know, in understanding you need a budget takes away the future and allows you to be present. But how does budget, you know, simplify or is it simply just your priorities having a budget and then actualizing what's in your budget? Yeah, I mean, in, in the simplest terms, you're taking a pile of money and you're dividing it up into what that money should do. And you're thinking about the current jobs and the future jobs. And and then what you're really trying to see is, well, it, when you say actualizing, that's it. I mean, the traditional idea of a budget is, you know, you look at your variance and you look at actual versus forecasted, right? And you all know, know that if you looked at a PL or whatever. But we want to say, okay, now that I'm, I've got, let's say 300 bucks here for restaurant spending, and I spend a little bit, my actual is now $150 in restaurant. And then at the end of the month, maybe I only have $15 in there. And, and that's just you saying, well, am I staying true to what my plan was? The important part here is when people hear the word budget, they don't think um, I'm going to self-actualize. I'm going to realize my values. I'm going to prioritize and seek contentment. No, they just hear, oh, I can never have fun again. Oh, Oh no, all, every, all fun has been drained out of the system or I'm just restricted. It'd be like going on some just crazy, crazy stringent diet and it just won't last. People need to recognize that a budget is just their plan for their money to see their goals actualized. Exactly. Now, one uh, independent variable that screws up money, money's an energy. We both talked about that. We I totally believe, but I am very anal retentive, OCD. I've been a, a budgeter. Even when I lost over a hundred million, I, I had my budget. My problem was my emotions. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about having a relationship to that energy, energy and motion, emotion uh, can screw up a plan, right? I always say, mm -hmm. come up with a well-developed plan. God will laugh at you mm -hmm. because he'll give you emotions. And all of a sudden you have this innate need that I got to have that boat even though it's not in my budget. Um, how can we find joy in the relationship with money and put a better uh, relationship together with my emotions and my money, the two energies synergizing together? Yeah, that's a good question. It's interesting because we, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of shame and a lot of guilt as far as emotions go that are attached to money. When people first come to us, and, and they're thinking, I got to do a little better. You know, they've experienced something and it's just made them realize this isn't, I, I could do better. I make an adult amount of money. A lot of people say, what, what do I have to show for it? And it's interesting how we have to kind of tease apart the, the shame and the guilt. Our third rule is a strange rule, but it fits here into your question. We call it rolling with the punches. And what we're trying to get away from is not maybe that you suddenly have this desire for a boat. That would be an interesting thing to tease apart. And if we were having lunch, I'd be like, tell me about this boat. Tell me more about it. Visualize it. Who's on the boat? What are we trying to achieve here? And you, as you peel back a lot of that desire, you start to find kind of core elements for people. And they start to talk a lot of the time about family and time and experiences and memories. And you can sometimes get to a point where you'd say, well, now what you, you said you wanted a boat, but you actually want a lot more time with your kids and you maybe, and you've loved the water and you spent time on the water as a kid. So there's this, there's like, suddenly you're, you're facing the ceiling on a couch, right? So in that, in that situation, we can get to kind of the why behind the purchase and we can pull back the marketing of the sweet and sexy boat and be like, oh, these are actually really good marketers and they're doing their job and they're appealing to your emotions. So let's dive, dive a little deeper and, and get in there. But the beauty of a budget that's yours, it's your plan, is our third rule where you roll with the punches, meaning I just saw this ad for a boat or my best friend just got a boat or any number of totally emotional things, not logical at all. It's a, it's a punch to the face. And you, you want to move your face in the direction of the blow. That's what they do in boxing to lessen it. And that's what we want to do in budgeting. So we want to acknowledge David wants a boat now. And then the beauty of it comes in where you look at all of your priorities. You say, well, let's talk about it. Where should it come from? And you start to kind of move money around. 
we would talk about, do you want to lease a boat, buy a boat, partner with someone with a boat? Do you have a have friend, a friend that you with want to, a boat? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a friend with a boat? Yeah. Do you want to not have a friend anymore? Cause then you could partner together. That would be almost guaranteed. <laughs> right. no, so, That's so great any, advice. <laughs> but any, any number of ways that we could kind of address the need. But what's interesting is the emotion of the initial response can be tempered very quickly by the person looking at all of their other priorities and having those priorities tug back on that scarce resource that is money. And suddenly we can be like, well, I thought I wanted a boat, but as I walk through this, I realize it's a little different and we can kind of tease apart the emotion and, and get to the kind of the root of it. So I love that we can say, yes, get a boat. Absolutely. Budgets should allow for boat lovers to buy boats, but we want to make sure that we know the why behind it. And so you let the budget kind of do the talking and you let all of your priorities kind of raise their hand and say, hey, what about us? And you feel, this is feeling, you feel what you're trying to get there. And, and then, yeah, if, if the answer is get it, then you get it. Eyes wide open. I love that, man. Uh, genius is defined as the expression of God. And man, that's genius. I just want to tell oh, everybody, you. go back and listen to that because- People will make and save millions by utilizing rule number three. Uh, rule number four, I never got to. What, what is rule number four? Yeah, we call it aging your money. And it's like a, like a good wine gets better as it ages and sits, right? We want money to sit for a little bit. So if, if you were to get a windfall today and you say, Jesse, I just, I just got a $30 million windfall. I, I did not expect it. It just landed. It's in my checking account. What should I do? I would say sit. Don't do anything. Because right now you're in an emotional state that's, just not quite normal, right? So you sit on it. People are in that state of heightened emotion all the time because most live paycheck to paycheck, about 80%. So when a paycheck lands, it's like they got that big windfall. It's the same emotion. And their decision-making is not the highest quality. Um, they're feeling um, reactive. They're feeling like a little whiplash there. And they're used to this uh, meaning they're acclimated to it, but they don't know that it's a negative. So when we are following the first three rules, we can get to a point where a dollar that you earn today, it will sit in your checking account or wherever for 40, 50, 60 days. Not because you've done anything special. You're just following the first three rules. And then when you spend that dollar, you can look at it and you say, when did this dollar enter David's system? And you'd look at it and we track this in the software. I mean, it, you wouldn't do it manually or anything, but you could look at it and you'd say, oh, that, that's about 45 days old, 50 days old versus the norm of, of people spending money before they even have it, you know, in the form of credit cards or whatever. So people get a paycheck on Friday, they spend it all on Monday because there's a pile of bills waiting for their money. We want to flip that all around and have a pile of money waiting for a bill to land. You have the thing on auto pay and you don't give it a second thought. And that's the idea of, of aging the money. Get away from that financial edge, that stressful spot where you don't sleep as well. Or you think about this, when you're sharing spouse, you know, finances with your spouse and you say something totally benign, like, oh, you went to Target today, right? That's <laughs> whatever. Well, that could be totally loaded. I'm being a little stereotypical here, but yeah. it could be totally loaded because there, it's a stressful environment. The paycheck or the checking account balance is very low. So- when there's that stress there, suddenly that benign comment, like, oh, you went to Target? And the next thing out of your mind, you know, your head was, did you also change the oil? Because it was in the safe spot. But instead, they just heard like, why are you attacking me about Target? Or if I were to flip it around the other way. I spent this much. Or yeah, I only yeah. did this. I only did this. It's like you're pointing fingers. All of that happens because there's a lot of stress in the room. It's, it's like trying to negotiate a big deal. And, there's, and it's all just stress. You don't get to a good spot there. So people need to be in a good emotional state. And couples don't realize that they're living their lives together, totally stressed about money. It's no wonder that money is so loaded for them. As soon as it's even in the, just the slightest way mentioned, the conversation just derails. So you, you age your money, get rid of the stress and watch your conversations around money with your partner become so much easier. I'm li living proof of that and understanding those relationships of the unintended offense and the need to be offended when it comes to discussions with money. Um, no, I, I have last question and it, you, you are first for me, you know, I've had over a thousand interviews, I think in just during COVID, but <laughs> even more yeah. importantly, um, I've never seen a 34 day trial. You, you give YNAB, you need a budget for free 
for 34 days, not 30 <laughs> days, not 10 days. I've never seen a 34 day trial. Why, why'd you do a, a 34 day trial uh, for YNAB? So I, I wish that I could say like the smart marketer in me saw that it was like a little odd hook that would catch their attention, but Got mine. it wasn't that at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you appreciated it. You're like, hey, that's different. But the, the idea was we want to have people learn to put money into one of those buckets, right? Like they want to save up to buy. I, I want to buy a nice miter saw pretty soon, right? So I want to save up a little bit. We want them to have more than a month, no matter where they start in the month. We want them to have more than a month to see that that balance roll over. And then when they add more money in it to see it grow even bigger. So it's purely pragmatic where we want to have people see the magic of the month changing from April to May or whatever it is and seeing their balances grow as they start saving for things. It's crazy, David, but a lot of people don't know what it's like to save up for something. And when they, when they, they don't think they even can, and they're so used to not having money that when they do have money, they actually actively spend it because they know it won't last, which is very counterintuitive, but it's, it's deeply psychological. And so when we can prove to them, Hey, look, you saved money from last month and it's added to this month, the light bulb goes on and we've got them. Yeah. Believe it or not from Einstein, who's one of the most intelligent human beings ever to live. He will talk about the energy of money, the compounding, the exponential growth of money aggregating and accumulating upon itself. And it's not just the money that compounds, it's the energy that yes. compounds and, you know, understanding paying yourself, understanding having a savings objective uh, of allowing the accumulation and compound interest of money is essential. I have not seen a better app than YNAB oh, uh, to help people with this. I know Marshall, Falk and I, the Hall of Fame running back, we're gonna incorporate YNAB to all of our uh, community and I'm going to pass it over to Ed Milet and the WFG guys because it is the clearest uh, to me way to help people be financially liter literate Absolutely. and take control of not only their money but their happiness, their health, their wealth, and their worthiness, which comes along with that energy. Uh, Jesse, you are amazing. Jesse Meekum, he's the founder and author of You Need a Budget, YNAB. Get the peculiar 34 day trial. You know, if you only last 30, I get it. That's what I teach 30. But if you can go 34, why not? You need a budget.com. It's an incredible way to change your life and change your money.